Hello, and welcome to episode number 155 of the Board Game Barrage podcast. This is your host, Christina the Blue Tank, and I have with me Mark the Green Tank. Hey. Neelan the Orange Tank. Hello. And Kellen the Red Tank. The color of blood. I thought you were just going to say red. (laughs) We are back for our second segment of Top 50 Games of All Time. So, as you might have guessed, this being the second segment, today we're going to be talking about games 40 through 31 on our list. So, Neelan, will you start us off with your number 40 best game of all time? Yeah, absolutely. My number 40 game is the second Feld game on my list. I mentioned last episode that Oracle of Delphi moved up. In the Year of the Dragon also moved up because I also managed to play this a couple of times this year. In the Year of the Dragon is a game that I like to describe as a people death simulator because that is the predominant thing that happens in the Year of the Dragon. Often when I'm explaining this game to new people, the two things I remind them of is that money is scarce and people will die. You're collecting (laughs) people into your palaces. Those people are going to sort of power up the action spots on the board. And you have a free choice of which people you get into your palace at any given time. At the end of every round, you pick one from your deck of cards, of which you have a single card only, and say, I'm going to take the farmer into my palaces this turn. That means if I do the rice action, I'm going to be able to get more rice. And the reason I'm doing this is because there are these events that are coming down the pipe. And they just feel like this death knell bell (laughs) ringing. Because you just see the event four coming along. It's like, oh my god, if I don't have enough rice by the time I get to (laughs) round four, all these people are dying. And it feels great, but it's so tight and it's so fun trying to figure out how you're going to like weave your way through of all the horrors coming down the line. This is my favorite Feld game. I know most people who are Feld fans would probably not feel the same, but they're wrong. This is In the Year of the Dragon. Neilan has sort of already mentioned this, but I just remember the first time we were taught this game, the punctuation and or your people will die like, <laughs> yes. came up like 15 times, literally. I think that we should commit to, in 2021, four mini conventions, namely Neilan Con, Kellen Con, Mark Con, and I Christina Con, so where we kind of go through the back catalog of stuff that's just like... Like, I know I will like this, and you've brought it up enough times, but, like, when else are we going to get to sure. it? I love um, it. Because I'd love to try this one. That is my number 40 game in the Year of the Dragon. Thanks, Milan. <laughs> I saw <All> your right. <laughs> eyes. <laughs> my 40th favorite game of all time is a little game you might recognize by the chant... To chew, to chew, to chew, to chew, to chew, to chew, to chew. This is Fuji Flush. Have we talked about that on the podcast? Are they in on the joke? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is an inside joke that you are on the inside of. This is a card game where you're just trying to get rid of all your cards, and every turn you just play one card. Seems really simple, right? But no, wrong. Because yeah, wrong. Anytime somebody plays a card higher than the cards previously played, those cards are flushed. They're discarded and you have to draw a new card if your card was flushed. So that's the main rule. But what makes this game fun is, as I alluded to, the two-chew train or any chew train. And that, that happens whenever somebody plays the same card as you. If somebody plays the same card as you, then the values of those cards are added together. And then the only way somebody can flush your cards is by playing a higher card than that added value. And that continues. If three players play twos, then you're up to six, six, right? Oh my gosh, math. Uh, Then you're up to six. You can play this with a ton of people. And so two two can actually become a very big number and impossible to beat. And so what ends up happening in this game is I will play my two and, you know, I know I'm going to be kicked out, but I'll kind of look at Kellen who's next and I'll be like, Kellen, you could join the two two train. (laughs) And if I can convince him to do that, then we are together stronger and we can convince the next person to make us even stronger. And this works really well especially when somebody has like one card left and everybody else is just like combining forces to try to keep them from winning. So this is a fantastic game that we all love a lot and it is my 40th favorite game of all time. The second uh, Frieza on your list. Yeah, Friedman Third, Frieza. actually. Oh, third on your list. I had Fresh Fish, Fast Sloths, and Fruity oh, Blush. yeah. Well, I the that. Fs, the yeah. F alliteration. Is this third. man a doctor? I don't believe so. He does have green hair, though. We could declare him one. 
We could. I think we have in the we past. We do love doctors. <laughs> I think we have called him like an honorary doctor or yeah. something. Okay. Maybe. I think he might be close. My- Freeman Frieza, fresh fish, fast, lost, Fuji flush. <laughs> That's My- just a summary real quick. <laughs> <laughs> My 40th favorite board game of all time is new to the list this year. This is the clever area control game Rumble Nation. This is a filler length plus game that uses such a cool dice system that I just adore. You roll three dice and you are choosing how you split them up, right? Because you are impacting an area with a certain amount of troops from one of the dice. And then the area you choose is made up of the other dice. This game is like a coiled spring where the entire game is one depression of that spring and then you let go and you watch it pop and it pops and it pushes outward. This troop spills into that troop, which spills into that battle. You are reinforcing each battle based on the order in which the battles take place, which changes every single game. This is a game that you will play once. You will want to run it back immediately. This is uh, an imported game that I think these systems will be taken from Rumble Nation and reused in future games. What a revelatory game for me, one that I, I love having in my collection. I'm super grateful to have discovered this past year, Rumble Nation. My number 40 would have sounded a lot better if Neilan hadn't screwed up and waited one more spot to mention it, and we could have had a double crossover. My number uh, 40 was my number 38 last year. That's Pipeline. Pipeline is an economic engine builder with like a spatial tiling aspect. Just a really clever, interesting economic game. You know, you've got the heavy economic game, which is, you know, not a rare thing, but with the spatial aspect to it. And as Neilan mentioned so eloquently in the last episode, you've got a lot of things to consider, including going after these game-breaking powers, but you can definitely win the game without even going after them because one of the resources that is, I think the most valuable resource in the game is like time is just like the number of actions you have. You don't have very many actions in this game. And if you choose to go after these big powers, you are doing it at the cost of other things you could be doing. The spatial tiling thing can be a little frustrating for me just because part of me feels like I've got the pieces, just whatever the best one is, is what I'm doing, you know? And the fact that you have to spend time like putting these together can get a little frustrating, but also it can be fun and it is clever and it is different. So I definitely forgive it for that. I love the idea of, you know, just making this, these long pipes to refine oil as well as you can. And, you know, if you've got this one really, really great pipe, then you can make the blue oil, like skip two refinement levels in one jump. And it's just, there's a lot of cool aspects to it. Just a, a very clever, unique, heavy economic game that is Pipeline, my number 40. Just some bros laying some pipe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Neilan, can you take us to number 39? How come neither of you have invited me to play to, pipe? To lay pipe? Uh, we should. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> no, not that part. We should play Pipeline. Um, <laughs> I do I do think you'll... I, I, don't, I actually don't know if you'll like it, but yeah. there's a chance. My number 39 game is... There's always is, a chance. There's always and... a chance. <laughs> My number, Maybe tonight. <laughs> yeah. My 30, number 39 game is Oleon. This is a bag builder. Bag builders are a lot like deck builders in that you are trying to collect chits that are going to improve your ability to do things later down the line, except maybe a lot more fun because you're rummaging around in little cloth bags, pulling them out every turn, seeing what abilities you're going to be able to play and trying to make the best use of those in order to collect more chips, which will go into your bag for future turns in order to get resources to get victory points. This is quite a interactive game in that there is a map that people are sort of competing for like control of cities as they move around there are these boards where at towards the end of the game you are desperately trying to get your chips out of your bag onto these boards in order to get some final victory points they get quite competitive and trying to find the right time to remove those from your bag in order to turn them into points on those boards for points and rewards is critical in Orlean. a game i really enjoy playing a lot and i think that the novelty of bag builders often carries this for people who might otherwise be overwhelmed by you know, a medium heavy Euro game. That's all on. 
I kind of felt like I burnt out on all the own, but with the inclusion of the Traders and Intrigue expansion, it really breathed a lot of new life into the game, and uh, it sort of reignited my desire to play it again. In the immortal words of Mark Bigney, Orléans. Oh, that does not sound like how Bigney says it. <laughs> Bigney says it. Orléans. <laughs> Orléans. I think I'm way closer. <laughs> it's more of a guttural utterance than anything else. Yeah, you just sounded like you were gargling salt water. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. That's like a one-for-one <laughs> yeah. one recreation of it. <laughs> that is my number 39, Orléans. All right. And my number 39 is a game where you are allowed, and not just allowed, but encouraged to cheat. Anybody know what this game might be? <laughs> Monopoly Cheaters Moth. Edition. 39th favorite game of all time is Cheating Moth, oh. the best bug game of all time. It's a simple card game, and truthfully, the game doesn't matter. Like, what you're doing with your cards doesn't matter. They just had to give you a couple of mechanics so that you were worried about what was in front of you. You had to, like, be really watchful of what was going on in the game. Like, they had to make you super paranoid. But then they also gave you this ability to cheat. And the rules for cheating are you can cheat in any way that you want, which is fantastic. We've had people just like slowly slipping cards into their sleeves, like one by one until they have no cards in their hand left. There's one person who is the policeman or what is it called? There's like a watch. The hall monitor. There's a watchman. Yeah, but what would it be for bugs? Like a gardener? Is he a gardener? No, I thought it was like a type of bug. Isn't it a type of bug? Oh, it's a type of bug. A cockroach? <laughs> Cocker lacking? Okay, well, there is one person who takes on the role of trying to catch the cheaters. And it is just riotous. Like I said, there will be one person, and it's usually me, by the way, who just like slowly hides all their cards in like one place. And then all of a sudden, their cards are gone. And the person who's been watching is just like, how did that even happen? <laughs> and then sometimes like they'll look and there's cards all over the floor. You don't want to be caught cheating because then you become the person who has to catch other people cheating. The funniest thing for me in this game is when there's an oblivious person who's the hall monitor. Because like cards are just like flying everywhere. <laughs> cards are on the floor. Cards are getting thrown behind people's backs. And like you're not allowed to call out or try to help the hall monitor find that person. So you're just like snickering as you watch <laughs> everyone lose all of their cards. This is hilarious. It's from the same company that does Cockroach Poker with that sort of art design that's fun. I I'm not familiar with that game. What is it? I've never heard of Cockroach Poker. This oh, might, might cacker, go by to cacker lacking. Cacker lacking. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a great time. If you've never played it, you should just play it as soon as you can see your friends again. That's my number 39 favorite game of all time, Cheating Mop. My number 39 favorite board game of all time is also new to the list this year, but not new to me, just something that has risen as an experience that I love. This is a card game that you probably can't buy right now, but you could print and play your own. This is I, My Favorite Things. This is a trick-taking slash party game that you get to know your friends throughout. So you have different categories that you're assigned, and each player makes answers to those categories and ranks them. So favorite dinner items, you know, and favorite breakfast items, or people that you would like to meet who are dead. And then Mark would rank all of those people, and he would have someone in the zero slot who he wouldn't want to meet who is dead. And that hand would get passed to another player, and then you play a hilarious game of trick-taking where you Cards are beating other cards, but you don't know the numbers of the cards, and you're having to evaluate what are Mark's favorite colors, what is Neelan's favorite date night activities, you know, and... Um, <laughs> Do not ask that question. Yeah. The look like on your face right Rang now. Not have that as a question. <laughs> it's kind of this just sweet experience, um, except for hearing about Neelan's date night activities, where where you get to know your friends... You're playing a simple game, and it doesn't really matter what's happening because you're together. But just a, a fantastic idea for a game, just one that, that has risen in my mind, and, and I've, I've played it a few times. I made my own copy of this. That is I, My Favorite Things. I'm going to read some reviews for my number 39 favorite game of all time from BGG. As a game, it's no good. Even as a drunk party game, it's no good. But it has its use as a so-so teaching aid in English class. Another one. Another one. Not a game. 
Another one. Played once years ago, ended in an argument. Not fun. And finally, <laughs> donated to Saginaw Senior Center. <laughs> This person also has another entry in the reviews donated to Mensa 76. So maybe that's why I like it. Maybe I was at uh, Mensa 76 when I found it. This is the lowest rated game on my list by far. It's a 4.6 on BGG. This is a question of scruples. I don't know what's wrong with these people because this is a great game. Okay, this is a lot like True Colors where you have to play with the right group of people, people that you're close with and, and you feel comfortable with. And what you're doing is there's a game that you can play but really what it devolves into is just asking other people moral dilemmas like whether they would do this in this situation or that in this situation and it just sparks a lot of conversation like where do you draw lines like what do you find acceptable what do you find not acceptable can you believe that kellen would do xyz spoiler you cannot believe it well if you're making me answer the question in front of her <laughs> Yeah, we, we had a blast playing this. I've always had a blast playing this with friends. I don't know why it's rated so low, but I am interested in this re-implemented by Scruples for Kids. <laughs> I don't know what that could amount to, but if you're looking for a fun party game with people that you trust and you're just trying to you know see what boundaries are, I think A Question for Scruples is a blast. I kind of feel like you can play it with people that you're not as close to as True Colors requires. Yes, right. I agree. You don't have to have intimate knowledge of the other right. people to play this at all. Yeah, and it's still super fun finding out, even if it's like a stranger, like, oh, wow, they would rob a an old lady instead right. of whatever. Yeah. In fact, as the review says, it is a so-so teaching aid uh, for English class. So <laughs> you don't need to know anybody to play it. Oh. Yeah, I just, I love it. My number 39, Question of Scruples. I find, like, that style of person who, like, has a top 50 board game list and it says, like, I don't consider party games board games. You know, like, Scruples and True Colors would be, like, the opposite of a good time for them. Right. This is a great game. Thank you, Mark. My number 38 game is a new entry for my list. It is not a new game. It is a relatively old game. This is a 2009 Hansa Teutonica. I played this for the first time in 2020. It is a relatively simple rule set. The game is essentially about placing markers along routes and then scoring them when you complete them. But the brilliance of that is that it's as much about divvying up your time between placing routes for your benefit and blocking other players. Uh, and if you're not doing that effectively, if, if you're not checking what routes other people are trying to complete and blocking them at other opportunity, you are not playing Hunt's Titanica. Because part of the brilliance of the rules is that anytime someone tries to replace your cube, you get sort of paid back double. So they are incentivized to block people. You are trying to create connected chains of structures across the map, ultimately, but the game's over before you know it because of the way that the end of the game clock works. So that's always creeping up on you, just wondering if you're going to have enough time. Um, brilliant, brilliant game. Very excited for the re-release of this, which is imminent, I believe, of the Hunter Titanica Big Box. I think what I just realized is that we have something even bigger than a triple crossover, which we already celebrate very loudly, and that would be a quadra crossover, which I will predict now for, for our good friend Hansa Teutonica. That's excellent. It's a deserving game of the first quadruple crossover. My number 38 game, Hansa Teutonica. Thank you, Neilan. All right. My 38th favorite game of all time is Carnival of Monsters which is a card drafting game and a card drafting game in which you are not only drafting the monsters, which you will play, but you're drafting the things you need to play the monsters. This is an incredible production. This is made by some of the artists from Magic the Gathering and the designer is Richard Garfield. And so it really, really throws you into this kind of magical world and it just feels delightful to play this game. There's a very real sense of like immersion and the closest thing that it reminded me of was just being a kid and like playing games. So I've just had great experiences with this. I would be remiss not to say menagerie <laughs> when we talk about Carnival of Monsters. I think that the different suits and the colors of monsters are all thematically linked to the different colors. And you kind of go deep in one or two of them and then hope that the cards come up that you need. And there's a, just enough hate drafting because you might steal a high-powered version of a color that you know your neighbor has gotten into. This is a very lavish production, but it's sort of that gothic fantasy 
setting with dragons and goblins. It's, it is beautiful. It's like if you compare it really directly to like Ethnos, which we just talked about, it's like wah, wah, you know, like Carnival of Monsters is just amazing. And it's very quick and tactical. Garfield, I think, is very good at that. And it kind of feels a little like Magic the Gathering, yeah. even though it's nothing really like Magic the Gathering. Yeah, exactly that, because, you know, you need to get the lands to get the monsters, and the card art is evocative of classic Magic the Gathering as well. Like, they just feel like these very, like, old-timey fantasy artworks. It's great. That is Carnival of Monsters, my 38th favorite game of all time. My number 38 is a game that was number 50 on the list last year, moved up quite a bit. This is the first Oink game on my list. We kind of have a little Oink counter with a little, but don't do... A pig sound, Mark. You know I'm going to do. I do not like that. That's the worst (laughs) part about Oink games. Counter, and that's That's the the worst worst part about Oink games. It's the worst part. Why did they make it after a pig? (laughs) They think pigs are cute. Pigs are cute. This is no. Yeah, pigs are cute. They're cute. They're curly little tails. Speaking of pigs. Luchadors, Mask Men, my number three best board game of all time. Mask Men is a trick taking game where the relative value of the luchadors in the game is decided as you play. So they are all sort of squaring off against each other. It has a fascinating system of determining which luchador is most powerful, and they sort of jockey for position as the game progresses. Amazing game, amazing production, beautiful art. It's the perfect game for someone who has seen a lot of trick-taking games, who's seen a lot of card games and is maybe not as excited about what's out there. This You just put it in front of them and it's, just, it's confusing. It's confounding that it works. I really enjoy this one. I think it's a fantastic little game. Like most Oink games, Mask Men. If you've seen it all and you're tired, it's time for Mask Men. That's right. I have Kellen to thank for my number 38 best game of all time. There should be a lot of things you're thanking me for. <laughs> <laughs> this is Genoa. Genoa is a Euro game where everything is up for negotiation. I was thinking about it, and I think Genoa is the better version of Chinatown. Chinatown is a game that I wanted to like because of the negotiation aspect, but I found it too mathy. You can calculate a little too much what deals are good and what deals aren't. In Genoa, the whole Euro aspect of it, where you're trying to get things and exchange things, obfuscates that, makes it a little opaque. And I just love that everything is up for negotiation. On your turn, when you're in control of the pawn, you can either move the pawn the way you want to wherever part of the of Genoa you want to, to grab things or to sell things. But you can also sell the right to move the pawn. And I just love that. I mean, everything in this game is up for negotiation. It is the ultimate Euro negotiation hybrid. Fantastic, fantastic game. Is that some shots fired at Neelan? If so, I'm very happy with you. Oh, I get you. Yeah, I think it does beat the game that Neelan may be talking about earlier, in which a game that dropped off my With list. a one-word title. With a single title. Well, it went from three words to one word. <laughs> it was Traders of Genoa, now it's just Genoa. But... A huge miss that the four of us have not played this yes, together. Yes, 100%. Just a, a huge miss. Yep. I could imagine Christina's mood during this game, and it would get quite spicy. <laughs> Before I go, I'm going to leave you with this question. You are playing Marbles for Keeps. A younger boy loses all his marbles to you and starts to cry. Do you give him back his marbles? That is a question from Scruples for Kids. <laughs> and that is also number, number 38 game, Genoa. Wait, are we also kids? Yeah, you must be a kid to play this. But yeah, so. I think we should just clarify that we're recommending we're not all the kid kids. version. <laughs> yes, right. Well, you know what? I think that's a thought-provoking it question. Well, Scruples for Kids, though, it might be like, yes, you should, because being <laughs> nice is nice. <laughs> my number 37 game is the first game on my list by Mr. Uwe Rosenberg. Probably the first Uwe Rosenberg game I played. This is Agricola. It is sliding slightly down my list. I have not played Agricola in a very long time, but my enthusiasm for it was a little bit buoyed by having played All Creatures Great and Small. 
this year. It reminded me sort of how much I just love Agricola conceptually, like building your little fences, penning off your little animals, collecting buildings to do all of that better. There is a harshness to the worker placement in Agricola, which is not always my favorite thing, but I think works so well in actually making the worker placement feel meaningful. There's also this element of having to feed your family, which is just also tense in a way that I dig. Agricola has a whole lot of replayability in it with these building cards, which there are countless expansions that just add to this deck. This is probably going to be a mainstay in my top 50 because I will probably never lose my enthusiasm to play this. It is an excellent game that is Agricola. It also features our favorite form of animal reproduction. Yes. Uve sex. Exactly. I would be remiss not to have at least one animal breeding game in my <laughs> list. That is number 37, Agricola. If someone can help us do the math, we've been looking to have this answered for all of 20. 20- 20 how four animals can only make one baby my 37th favorite game of all time is ohanami this replaced the game for me ohanami is the game but the competitive version i still love the game and i think there is room for both but i just liked this so much more when we played it so ohanami adds a drafting element that the game doesn't have and obviously since it's competitive you're trying to hurt your neighbor so when you're choosing your card you want one that's going to work well for what you have but you're also looking at everybody else's boards and it just adds that a little element of cutthroat that for me elevates the game the game being the game that ohanami (laughs) replaced um and it's also a lot less confusing to talk about than the game because (laughs) the game is named the game so that's why i love ohanami that was what i was going to actually say is like if this game was within spitting distance of the game i would choose it over the game for spite over the name (laughs) of the game that is ohanami my 37th favorite game of all time my 37th favorite game of all time is new to me this year there is a new version of this game coming in 2021 i would say this is my favorite game that i discovered in 2020 and i discovered it in my closet i said I haven't played that yet. I can't remember why I wanted that. So I took it out of the closet. I looked it up. That was Throne and Grail. This two-player card game is excellent. It is a tug of war. There are two ways to win in Throne and Grail. You can either get all three pieces of the crown and win immediately, or you can win by points. So it is a tense game of back and forth that feels a little like one of my favorite games of all time, Coloretto, because you're adding cards to one hop, and then at any time, but only once per round, can you take five cards from that hop. And so the game is essentially, should I add cards or should I take? And it's very exquisitely painful. Getting all three crowns feels a little like shooting the moon. It feels for that like little thing that could happen, but probably won't. Especially because two to three cards are not even in the game. So you may actually have a full game of Throne and Grail where it's not possible to even make the full crown. I think this is just so good. I am upset that I have not played it with Mark and Neelan yet. I think they will both enjoy it a whole hell of a lot. Very excited for this to come back to the market in 2021 and will be shouting from the rooftops my love of this game when it is available again for sale and encouraging sales of the game. So excited to have discovered Throne and Grail. This was one of those games where we played a game and then we just immediately had to play it again and again and again and again. It is so tense and so painful in the way that we love. So I was sad that this didn't make my list, but it was close. I think there is something to be said here for the Lost Cities, Hanami Koji, Battle Lines, all of those two-player games do have some shelf life to them where they are classics they are amazing but you maybe do want to throw them out or replace them as as time goes on and so this one is the newest one for me so take that bias for what it is i'm so happy to have it and so happy to play it at any time right now but i do think that genre has a shelf life for me my number 37 game is new to my list which surprised me because i've liked this game for a whole long time this is ricochet robots To me, this is the puzzle party game on my list. So I've done this before. I brought this game to parties thinking that, you know, me and a couple of people who are board game inclined would be the only ones interested in it. And almost always 
we just have people that start standing around the table just staring at the board trying to figure out the quickest way to get all the robots on their spaces. And that's what you're trying to do in Ricochet Robots. Robots are randomly placed on the board. There are a bunch of walls on the board and they have to go to randomly assigned spaces. So the blue robot has to go to his spot, the red robot to his spot, and so on and so forth. And what you're trying to do is to stare at the board and try to calculate the quickest way to get all the robots to their spaces. The reason that this is difficult is robots, as you well know, the rule is they move until they hit either a wall or another robot, as Isaac Asimov taught us. So that is a limitation. You can't just have them go and stop in the middle of the board. They have to go until they hit the wall or another robot, and you just have them ricocheting around the board. I absolutely love this game. I can't think of any other games that fit the party puzzle game genre, and this one is it. This is a fantastic game. Love it a lot. Ricochet robots. When you first said that you brought this to a party, I thought you were going to say that you specifically brought this to a party to prove to Kellen that this was a party game <laughs> because he all, you know, that's what he always, he's always like, what kind of parties do you have, Mark, with people playing puzzles? And that actually also sounded a lot like him. So that was really evocative of <laughs> the way he talks to me. So I appreciate that. What I like about Ricochet Robots, and the only way that I've actually engaged with this, is that you can break this out for 10 minutes and be like, let's yep. do one round of this. We'll just whip it out. We'll see you can do this as quick as you put it away and you're done. And, you know, it doesn't feel like it's a full ordeal. It's just like a, a really, really interesting like novelty of a puzzle game. The way I've always played it is actually the opposite, where I just set it out intending to play it once or twice or a couple times and then it just like becomes like a fixture mm. of the table where people are just wandering in and out trying to figure out the quickest way around the only redeeming thing about ricochet robots is its re-implementation in the johto region of pokemon gold and silver when you do a similar mechanism on the ice path on your quest to become the pokemon master of the johto region i would have of course mentioned that but i thought it was like taken for granted so i passed over that so yeah well the scholarly stuff comes from me. You, uh, you're the eye candy. That's right. Speaking of scholars, is there a doctor in the building? Because we have Dr. Reiner Knizia. <laughs> the second Knizia game on my list, Yellow and Yangtze. I'm almost certainly going to get a lot of flack for this being on my list and not Tigris and Euphrates. But I'll say this. I didn't feel like I wanted to have both on my list and Tigris would be lower because I played both games enough times to know that I prefer Yellow and Yangtze. And I think that the core reason, if I could describe it in one word, would be stability. Yellow and Yangtze sort of has a hex grid, which gives you a little bit more adjacency and also like limits the ability for people to completely overturn the game state from one round to the other. Because one of the things that happens in Tigris and Euphrates is that if a war happens, half of the city gets decimated. And that's part of the fun of that game, is sort of trying to figure out how the changing state of the board is going to work in your favor. Tigris and Euphrates feels like a little bit more like you can commit to longer term strategies. For my taste, at least, it's, it's probably a little bit simpler, a little bit more accessible, but I find myself enjoying it a lot more. The introduction of the yellow cubes, which are a catch-all wild resource, because if you're not familiar with either of these games, the way it works is whichever color of cube you have the least of at the end of the game is your score. Yellow cubes kind of pad your score similar to the treasure tiles in Tigris and Euphrates, and it kind of becomes like a focal point when a yellow pagoda comes out, and you're just like, okay, we have to stop that person before they collect too many. And I kind of really dig that. It also adds some new powers to each of the leaders and the, each of the colors in a way that I thought was neat. That is yellow and Yangtze. This is high on my list of games that I know I would grow in appreciation of if I played it more. And I know there's a digital implementation, but Neilan has not invited me to play it <laughs> We should actually. And somehow has played games and games of it without me. To that point, actually, I will say that I've played a lot of this digitally, and the digital implementation is excellent. And I don't know if I said it already, but this is a new entry for my list. Number 36, Yellow and Yangtze. Really rubbing it in there, Neil. And Kellen just talk about how you never play with him, and you just go on to say like, "I've played hundreds, a lot, yeah. <laughs> hundreds of games this year in quarantine, none with Kellen." My thirty-sixth favorite game of all time does not need much discussion, really, because we've talked about it. Kellen talked about it in last week's episode. Double crossover. Da -da 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 double crossover. My thirty-sixth game is Splendor. And I think we've talked about this a lot, but this is just like something you can break out at any time with any group of people. They don't even have to be gamers. The rule set is super simple. You get through a game quickly and it is always fun. It's always solid. It always delivers. 
and it always gives you that feeling that Neelan is constantly searching after, which he mentioned last time that this is number one for running your fingers yeah. through that component quality. What more do you want? Yeah, I think to that point, Christina, this joins the very small club of games that I have taught and enjoyed playing with my mother, and she loved it. Like, it's so accessible, and I still enjoy every play I have of Splendor. I taught my brother this game, like, probably three years ago, and he still brings it up. Like, we played it once <laughs> together, and he still brings it up. That is my number 36, Splendor. My number 36 favorite board game of all time has gotten 10 slots worse over the past year because I have not gotten it to the table. And that is cool, mini, or not Dogs of War. Dogs of War is a very tough game to describe, but you are placing workers onto slots while factions are duking it out. So red versus green and blue versus yellow. And everyone has a secret affinity for one house over the other. So you have long-term objectives versus short-term objectives that you get for placing workers onto a side of the conflict. You are also increasing your investment in different factions and how you want to influence this sort of game of houses. It just has the right theme to build alliances with other players where you're kind of like, oh, we both care about this happening and really fighting to have other players put their workers down. No, 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 no. You need to join my side for this battle. Don't you want three coins? I have not played this game with Mark, but I can imagine Mark really trying to sell people on no, this two coin slot is better than that slot, even though there's no difference, but it just benefits him to have you placed there. This is a lavish, over the top production that I think should come back. We need to get the mini list model of Dogs of War, but what a good game. There is nothing quite like it. You guys have not played this? I bought this based on your description of it and stuff I've heard about it, and I still have not played this. This is like a top three of my must plays. I desperately want to play this game. And somewhere in the 50s on your favorite <laughs> yeah, board games of all time. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I have played this once with you, Kel, and I'm shocked you don't remember. But, oh. but but this is definitely a game that I, every time I'm reminded of the existence of Dogs of War, I say to myself that we should play that again. It is good. I, I remember really enjoying it. Absolutely. That is Dogs of War, my 36th favorite board game of all time. I have trouble with the games that I have not played that year And, you know, at some point, if you haven't played it in five years, you know, is it your fault? Is it the game's fault? Should it move off of your list? This is the eternal struggle of making the objective top 50 board games of all time list. Oh, that would be such a good segue into my next one. But alas. But alas, (laughs) C-K-M-N. There's no doctors for my number 36 game, but there is a mister. This is Mr. Fister's Great Western Trail. Look at that. How smooth is that? (laughs) Um, Great Western Trail is a Wild West themed game without a gun in sight. It is a game where the board is a rondelle and you've got a hand management thing where you're trying to sell cows. Can you believe that? And the objective is when you get to the last spot on the board to have the best hand you can have. So you're trying to shed cards. You're trying to manipulate your hand. You're trying to draw cards all in an effort to have the best hand at the end of the rondelle to sell the best set of cows and then you go back on the rondelle and every time you go around the rondelle has changed because players are placing buildings they're making it more costly more difficult while you're making different stops more beneficial for you it's just a very unique sort of take on a euro game this whole rondelle and hand management you're not trying to like necessarily shed cards or whatever you're just trying to have the the single best hand at the end of the trip around the rondelle the game dropped seven spots for me from 29 last year to 36 but that's from a lack of playing it i'm just very eager to get it to the table again this is great western trail just today i had the thought i should buy great western trail because that one game i played of it with the two of you for whatever reason it's just lived in my head as something i really want to return to the main reason i've maybe not done that is the existence of maracaibo which shares enough dna i believe with great western trail that i i feel i ought to play that first before i buy a very similar game i do think that we could all do with exploring more mr fister in our lives with mombasa uh, blackout hong kong like a couple of, of games that i really desperately do want to try and just have not gotten to my number 35 game is pretty appropriate considering what kellen was just saying about this idea of games you have not played in a long time this is android netrunner I so love... It's not dead, neither. <laughs> it's not dead. I so love the core conceit of Android Netrunner. Like, it is an extremely cyberpunk 
game that uses asymmetric deck construction. One person is playing a corporation, one person is playing a netrunner, and those decks and those cards are completely unique between the two decks. So typically, if you're a netrunner player, you'll have a couple of good corp decks, a couple of good runner decks, and you sort of just trade blows with people of the opposite faction. The premise is that as the corporation, you're trying to install agendas into your servers to get points, and the runners are trying to run on those servers to uncover those agendas by breaking down their firewalls. It's such a cool idea, and I so desperately want to see whatever the next version of Netrunner is. Hopefully this doesn't exist in a card construction living card game form because I think one of the reasons the Netrunner has moved so far down my list is I just don't have the time for that type of game anymore. I would love to see the deck building version of this maybe or just something that takes that asymmetry and the idea of running on each other's servers into maybe even a completely different set of mechanics. I think unfortunately for me deck construction is a little bit dead and I don't know how much Android Netrunner is in my future. Here we are at number 35, as Neilan already said. Uh, my number 35. And my number 35. Double crossover. Dune double crossover. Ooh, the best sci-fi movie board game licensed game of all time. Dune is a meeples on a map with unique player powers and it has like a prairie not an airship it has some of the craziest moments of any meeples on a map game that we've played which is saying a lot because we love this genre and we play this genre all the time i think what makes dune so interesting is the core tenets of the game are supported by these asymmetric factions right like root exists with or without any of the asymmetric factions in it. But in Dune, all the cards that you buy in the auction, all of the money goes to one player, the Emperor. And it's like, that just doesn't even make sense when you read the rule book. You know, all the shipping, all the money you get spend putting ships on the map, all of that money goes to the Spacing Guild. And it's like, how does this game even work? And yeah, then all- like it seems like it's so imbalanced. It seems like it's impossible for it to even come together. And actually, I think probably some people say that it is too imbalanced. Uh, sure. And then, you know, and then you keep reading the rule book and the Atreides, it's like, you're the only player who can write things down because <laughs> you have a memory. And you're like, what? Excuse me? And then you get to the end and it's like, also, Ben Gesserit player, write down which other player you think is going to win and when they're going to win. And if that happens, you actually win instead. And it's sort of just like this, like, oh my god, like the stakes have just gotten so high. This is such an experience of a game with so much going on, so much special powers and silliness and storytelling baked in. It's perhaps the most thematic game I have ever played. It mirrors the world of Dune so well, which we also all have an affinity for, which helps. Don't get us wrong, it does help. But a spectacular new edition of this came out, which is very inexpensive, there is a lot in this box that you're getting from the new version from Gale Force 9, and they're they're even supporting it with new factions, right? We have the Talaxlu and the, I can't say any of the weird alien races that we just got, but I'm excited to try them. It's crazy because the Atreides, he has prescience, so he can see the cards that everyone else is bidding on. So you're having an auction where the Emperor is laughing as you drive up the prices. <laughs> the Emperor doesn't know what's being auctioned. One player does, and he's written all down. <laughs> and, and you're like, should I bid on this item, sir? Please help me. And if you're not in an alliance with that player, you know who knows how good that information is. What a weird game Dune is. Yeah. No, I think you said it perfectly. It is an experience and one that I hope we have many, many more of. That is our number 35 game, Dune. Straight to Mark. My number 35 game is Dune. No, I'm just kidding. My number 35 game <laughs> is a double crossover with Mr. Neelan. This is Soul, Last Days of a Star. It's such a weird game. Kellen has also mentioned this. The spatial aspect of it where you release your workers basically from your mothership that is constantly going around the board you're trying to get your timing right you're trying to build these structures that allow you to gain energy or do different things uh, just a very unique game unlike really anything else from an indie publisher it has that indie feeling done right just absolutely love this game 
Soul, Last Days of a Star. Also love the fact that there are a lot of different type of powers that you can include in the game, and different powers can be shuffled in each time. So, And some of the powers are quite strong, so you definitely get the feeling where, depending on which powers are included, the game can feel much different on a game-to-game basis. Funny enough, the reason that I don't like Soul or Quantum as much as both of you is they both feel like they have this one side of the game that is very tight and Euro-like, and then they have this other side that is power-based, and I don't like how they combine together in either Soul and in Quantum, and yet they both have these sci-fi themes, so in some way they are like together for me. They're very unique games, and I'm glad to play them and would be happy to play them in the future, but why they miss the mark for me personally. That's my number 35, Soul, Last Days of a Star. Down from 38 in 2018, 30 in 2019, and now 35. My number 34 game has actually moved up a few spots, and I think this is boosted by a play of this at Dice Tower West. This is Komet, uh, and also by the recent release of the 1.5 rules, which I think does a lot to really like enhance and tighten up some of the things that have always kind of been frequent issues with Komet, particularly around turn order problems. Komet is a excellent troops on the map game set in a mythological Egypt where part of the game is creating your sort of unique tableau of special powers from these grids of power tiles. You have four colors of these tiles that you drop that just combine to give yourself different powers and they're all thematically linked around the strategies of aggression or defense or economy and one of the things that's quite cool about that is you're sort of progressing down the tiers of these powers so it's almost like a little mini tech tree and your combination of powers is going to feel very different from another player's. This could lead to you having monsters on the map that no one else has and that's just cool. It's a game that also puts aggression forward. You're getting victory points just for winning fights so it doesn't encourage a turtling it encourages you to get out there and fight people Komet is an excellent game that I think got even better in this last year with these updated rules and I would still highly recommend it for anyone that likes this genre plus you can now play as Cthulhu in the game so that's a positive oh yeah they did do that didn't they Mr. Cthulhu has invaded kind of like a Super Smash Brothers crossover except better because I want Cthulhu in all my board games (laughs) I love this game as well. I think I've said this before, but I love how the drafting that you're doing, you kind of get to build your own player power. So instead of having these asymmetric player powers to start the game, you get to decide what do I want to be good at this game and you can change it every game. And it's just such a fun exploration. The best troops on a map games are the ones where you can just teleport around the board and every space on the board, guys, is equidistant to every other space. Oh my God. God. Wow. My number 34 (laughs) game. You gave that as much due as it deserved, Christina. (laughs) Moving swiftly on. (laughs) My 34 favorite game of all time is... Go ahead and insert some little squeals and oinks. Mark. Don't do it. An oink game called Startups. I have less Oink games on my list than Kellen does, but this is a great one that we all play all the time. It always comes to the table as just like a fun filler game that actually has substance to it. So in startups, you're deciding which company you want to invest in and you have to be super precise in that decision because if you have shares of a company but you don't have the most you actually have to pay the person who does have the most of that company the most shares of that company i'm honestly not very good at this game i always end up having to pay kellen for some reason Uh, (laughs) but i just love it we always have a great time my favorite thing about startups is that the icons and the company names are so cute that you kind of know what someone wants to go for. So Neelan, working in video games, is always trying to get the Bow Wow games. You know, me, I love coffee, so you know I'm going for Octo Coffee. And then Mark, because you know he loves Flamingo Soft. I feel like you've created these stereotypes. Like, Neelan is the video gamer. He only likes video game companies. Uh, Like, that doesn't actually happen in our games. I'm telling you, I'm telling you 100%, one of my paths to victory is if I'm in doubt, if it's 50-50, I do think that Neelan is going to go for Bow Wow Gaming. And Mark is going to go for Flamingo (laughs) Sauce. Because he loves condoms. (laughs) (laughs) Unlike Neelan. Yes. True. My least best dating activity is acquiring condoms. (laughs) (laughs) That 
is startups number 34 that's not staying in the Mine episode my oh that's yeah, great that's what do you mean is. that's you just built on like you just connected like seven jokes yeah, what are you talking great. about it has to stay <laughs> you connected it all it's brilliant mark is the ultimate decision maker in this <laughs> my number 34 favorite board game of all time is a double crossover with neelan this is my second <laughs> And final, Uwe Rosenberg game. This is Agricola, the bestest real worker placement game. There is an abundance of worker placement games coming up now where it's it's worker placement, but everyone can go on the same spot. Or it's worker placement, but there's 87 spots that all do the same thing. Agricola is what worker placement was designed to be that is very tight, where you need to have a backup action and a backup for that action. I love it in spite of the minor and major improvements and occupations, which I know the card system Neelan actually really likes. For me, it's just how tight the worker placement is. I would love to find a game actually that gets rid of of that stuff. Newsfjord comes close, but I don't feel like the worker placement is as tight as Agricola. Also, the theme of Agricola helps because Newsfjord is just about fish, whereas Agricola is about all the animals. Helen loves all creatures, great and small. Thank you, Christina. That is Agricola, my 34th favorite board game of all time. I still remember, though, in college, I remember where I was in college when I convinced three non-gamers to play Agricola with me. It was like in the basement of my friend's house. And so this has got to be like 2009 or 10. And I'm like, hey, guys, this will be fine. Like, we're just going to play it. And like, I set up Agricola and it was like a four hour affair. And it's like too dark and you can't see in this room. And I'm like, you know, that like classic, like, come on, guys, we're it's just going to be great. Like, it's going to be great. Like one more rule, one more rule, one more rule. And like, and my perception of Agricola now is that it's like solidly medium weight, you know, but at the time, it just blew my mind how heavy the box was and how long it took to get to the game. I don't, I doubt we even finished that thing <laughs> because, like, come on, guys, it's actually going to be great. Don't you worry. Agricola by Uwe Rosenberg. My number 34 game has been slipping consistently. It was number 11 in 2018, 24 last year, and now it's 34. This game first made its appearance on the Board Game Barrage podcast with episode number three in a very memorable way. It's Rising Sun. Rising Sun is by uh, Eric Lang in Come On Games. It's a troops on a map game with asymmetric powers. This is a theme that you hear a lot on our uh, list, but it's a type of game that we enjoy quite a bit. I really, really enjoyed it. I haven't played it in a while. I need to play it again. But I do like the asymmetric powers. I do like the way that the battles cascade and the way that you can see how the way that the battles are going to go from one region to another to another. I like the way that you can, in a commit sort of way, you know, you start with an asymmetric power, but you can also supplement that by buying different things, buying potential monsters. And the way the battle system works is unique. The blind bidding battle system is very uh, unique and a system that I, I enjoy. A great troops on a map game that I should get back out on the table before too long. It's hard to say why, but I feel like public perception in Rising Sun turned so dramatically since release, enough so that even Kellen likes to pretend that he doesn't like it anymore. But uh, <laughs> I was actually going to make the joke that I have influenced the public perception, <laughs> so yours is probably better. But Rising Sun is still my favorite of mine. It, I've probably played this, honestly, more than most games. It was the recurring game of one of my gaming groups. And it is higher up on my list, and we'll be talking about it a little bit more in a later episode. Rising Sun's excellent. I'm going to steal another one of Kellen's jokes and say, I wish you would have invited us because I think this actually would be on my list. And it's further down on my list. It just didn't make the top 50. Just because I haven't played it enough. I really liked it, but that was so long ago, and I just I just need to play it more. So I'm bummed, but... There are a couple systems that just aren't as fun as other systems. And there's there's a lot of front-loading of information as you have to figure out all the monsters that are available in that game. That's minor gripes. It's also got a whole ton of Kickstarter everything. you know, And I fear that that's what Onk is going to be as well for me, which is if you set it up and get it all ready, I probably would be excited to play. I think the production is lavish and exciting but just wouldn't choose it over other games in the system. And so it is a hard thing to rank when I like all of these type of games so much. And I think Eric Lang is fantastic at simplifying and streamlining these systems where you may end up with Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea. My number 33 game is a 
surprise new entry that has rocketed to the middle of my list. This is surprise. Surprise. <laughs> surprise. I mean, surprise for me because, like, I think one of the things that is fun about the process of doing these lists is you kind of just keep moving games up, and I was like, I'm just going to keep moving this one higher. Uh, that is Ross <laughs> Birmingham, uh, and this is where it ended up on oh, my list. Love. Ross Birmingham. I had a shockingly bad first play of Ross Birmingham, but my lasting impression, even from the, that play, was that this game is brilliant. I was so ready to like play it again and i ended up playing a few more games of it on tabletop simulator this year and following those i almost immediately went out and immediately ordered this game for my collection it is so good it is a very very heavy economic game of the sorts that i don't typically love like pipeline is maybe the only other one in my list but the degree of interaction in this game is so profound because a lot of what you're trying to do is set up depots of supplies that you want other people to use because you're incentivized for people to use up all the resources in your depot so that they flip and become points for you it has this very cool two-phase structure where the game is basically divided into two halves there's like the canal era and the train era and the game sort of builds upon your foundations of the first half to formulate the second half. You're progressing along specific like industry types in order to be like, I'm going to become the person that is the best at producing clay. And then that becomes your little niche on the board that hopefully no one is competing with you for so you can provide clay to the markets. Ah, oh, Brass is so good. And I think that the new additions, uh, I've not played Lancashire, which is, you know, the original version of Brass, but Brass Birmingham, at least, is an excellent game that I really, really love Roxley's new edition of. It is a stunning looking board, and I would highly recommend it. Brass Birmingham at number 33. I love this game. It'll be further up my list. All right. My 33rd favorite game of all time is the aforementioned by mark so this is is indeed a double crossover from uh, crossover. last week this game has a lot of screaming we've established that the reason people don't like this game is because they play with mark and i so as long as you don't play with us then anomia <laughs> might just be on your top 50 list of all time anomia is as mark mentioned a very fast-paced party game where you cannot think of the word that you're trying to come up with and this is literally a game that you can take to any party and people why are you shaking your head I mean, you haven't finished your sentence yet, so I guess. <laughs> and it will turn a dull night into a party. That's what I'm trying to say. Take it to any friend's house and turn that dull, boring dinner party into a party, party, party. Okay, so the problem with Anomia, right, is that it's very streaky. And the best players of Anomia are actually memorizing answers for cards as they come out. Okay, and so, no, long. they're not. No, they are. Who's doing that? Who do you know that's doing that? A hundred percent. When people are playing this game, as new cards come out right? There's a half of a match for everyone on the board. And so you can sit there and go, okay, a vacation spot in Europe, okay, uh, an island, this, and you come up with the answers. And then when another card comes out, you already have it ready to go. So it's, it involves think, memory. No, I think the way that this game is typically played, it's moving so fast that you don't have time to sit there and look at everybody's Neelan? thing. I could be convinced that that is an element of the game, but it, I don't think it's one that detracts from it necessarily because I do think it's changing enough so quickly that you would be hard pressed to be remembering like five or six answers simultaneously that are changing out all the time. That's a roundabout way of do you do this when oh, you I play? Don't do come it. up no. with answers? Liar. No, we, we've had the same. We've had Liar. this discussion before. Last time we played Anomia, I don't. I dislike it. It's weird because there are nights where I actually win Anomia. And I just feel like I'm on and it's like I'm there. And then the other nights, like I don't even score a point and I just feel dumb. So it's like it's streaky in that weird way. Like it's a good game. I respect it. But I think if you don't take yourself and the other players too seriously, you just jump in to have a good time and you expect to be very frustrated, but in a very fun way. It's a great game. I think of all the people I've ever met, I take myself the, <laughs> the most, most seriously. seriously. Wait, did you just say the most? Yeah. Oh, you agree with me. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, here's a chance to lighten up. Bring an Omiya to the table. Dinner table, game table, kitchen table, breakfast table. All right. Table. I will stop you with my 33rd favorite board game of all time. This is another game that I feel like came out 
tons of buzz, tons of love, and has slowly started to lose favor among many. This is Hanabi, a game where you cannot see your own cards. You are cooperatively using your cards to try to build piles of cards going from one to five, and you are giving each other clues, but you only have a limited number of clues. So you'll be telling Mark or Neelan, Neelan, you have two blue cards, and it's this card, and it's that card. Hanabi is a classic. I think it invented a new style of game where you cannot see your own cards. I have upgraded my version of Hanabi to Hanabi Deluxe 2, which I have never played any of the two features of it, but I like having the dominoes and think it's a really beautiful game. Each group that approaches Hanabi is going to have a little bit of a different metagame going into it. And I think a lot of the controversy around Hanabi is how much that metagame is wanted by the design of the game and how much of that is sort of added by players who are trying hard to win Hanabi. I just think it's splendid. I think it's so interesting and different. And I would love to pull it out and play it more often. And I think it's quite telling that like the premise of cards that are like hidden from other players has started to be reused in a bunch of other games. Like it's such an interesting core conceit. That is Hanabi. All right. Does someone need the Heimlich Maneuver? I hope so, because we got a doctor back in the house. <laughs> this is Kanizia's classic Raw. I like it because it harkens back to my homeland of Egypt, but I also like it because it's one of the best auction games around. Really simple rule set. Game goes really quickly, but a lot of interesting aspects to it, as the doctor is wont to do in his designs. Where do you start? You have three bidding tiles and whenever you win an auction with one of your bidding tiles, it becomes part of the next lot that is put up for bid. Other aspects are, you know, it's a set collection game. You're, you're bidding on these tiles and the different tiles score in different ways. Some of them score round to round. Some of them only score with, when other tiles activate them. It sort of feels like modern art in that way where, you know, modern art is one way of taking the auction mechanic and exploring it. Raw does the same thing with sort of the set collection. Even though it's an auction game through and through and, and that's it's known as being one of the classic auction games, it explores set collection in, in a couple of interesting ways. Another great thing about Raw is the push your luck aspect. You know, uh, everybody has three bidding tiles every round and you can win up to three lots of, of items. But if too many raw tiles come out, the round will instantly end. So you might not even have a chance to get everything you want if you get too greedy. If you try to push your luck too much, you might just get locked out and not get a thing. Clean, classic, interesting design by Knizia that we've come to expect. My number 33 favorite game of all time is Raw. This uh, was 44 in 2018, 26 last year. Now it's 33. That is um, number two on my list of in progress Pokemon re themes. <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of area to make like a really deluxe version of this game that I feel like uh, the market deserves. The market demands, not the Pokemon version, because I think only I demand that. But... <laughs> and you could just call it Raichu. That works. My favorite Pokemon. There you, go. you can have that for free. My number 32 best <laughs> board game of all time is. Deception Murder in Hong Kong. I was actually surprised that this moved up my list this year because I have not played it this year. This is one of those games that is not super viable in COVID times because it needs a fairly large group. But Deception Murder in Hong Kong is a game that is such an excellent social deduction party mainstay. It is probably the social deduction game that I would most recommend to people that don't love social deduction because if you're on the good side a lot of it is just almost this deduction game of trying figuring things out with your team cooperatively and if you're the murderer you sort of just have to do the same thing without giving away information you know there's an element of lying and bluffing but it's not as in your face as something like the resistance or the more pure social deduction games uh, it's a game where you have murder weapons and evidence in front of every player the murderer is going to pick two of their cards which are the actual cards and then everyone is going to try to deduce who is the murderer based on the two cards of the scene using clues given to them by the forensic scientist who's trying to point the other players to the correct cards using these little clue cards the forensic scientist basically acts as like a moderator but in a way that's also fun to be because you're listening to all the conversations you're trying to push people towards the right players the right cards so in a game that has like three almost disparate roles i kind of feel like everyone is generally having a good time uh, in deception i played so many games of this and i love it that is deception murder in hong kong at number 32 all right 
my number 32 game, we've got some more swinks and squeals coming in. This is Fafnir. Uh, I've talked a lot about Fafnir. Fafnir is a chicken that lays eggs slash gems and you're collecting those gems and you're trying to look at what other players are collecting. You're trying to make sure that you are collecting the gem that will be worth the most points at the end of the round, because at the end of the round, the cumulative amount of each color is the one that will score the most, but you obviously want to make sure that you are the one that has the most of the most so that you score the most. So you want to watch what other players are taking and you manipulate the market by what you bid. And so you can figure out that somebody else is going completely in on yellow and you can just decide to trash that color so that they do not score as many points. Or actually, in if anything is in the third, fourth, or fifth place, it scores negative points. I think what's interesting about Fafnir is for such a light rule set, what it forces you to think about and that's usually reserved for much longer, much more complicated games. But somehow every bid that every player makes has impact. And you're sitting there having to evaluate it the whole time. And it's just this cute theme of a chicken laying eggs. And it's like, it's silliness is, is part of the charm. As a production, I think Fafnir is also super great. Love, love the artwork in Fafnir. Yeah, the quality of the components is very, very high, as are most of the components in Oink Games. That is number 32, Fafnir. My third favorite game of all time is the same as it was last year. This is Imperial 2030. Imperial 2030 is a experience of a game. It is a war game. It is a risk-like game, except, except the control of countries changes during the game. This is spectacular. The order of, of turns goes by country, so it doesn't go by player. So you may have control of China right now, and so you take a turn. The ability to bluff in Imperial 2030 and to second guess why other players might be doing things with a certain country, because ultimately you're trying to take money from a country. You don't care about the country. This is perhaps the most cynical game that I like as someone who loves cynicism, you actually don't care about China and then someone else takes over China and you've just left it. <laughs> but you've gotten your money out of it. And so it isn't just a question of like, what does Neelan care about? It's why does Neelan care about his troops over there and these troops over there? And is he about to abandon that country? Or should I try to take it over because it's actually in a prime position to gain more profit? Imperial 2030 combines more traditional wargaming style stuff with just this cynicism and corruption and fun. My greatest memory from playing this with you guys was I had somehow taken over control of India, and I think it was India, and then Kellen came in and, and took it from me, and he's like, what did you do to this place? Like, what have you left me with? What? It was, there was like one factory, and it was like busted up. I'd, I'd stripped it for everything. Uh, yeah, this is a fantastic game. That is my number 32, Imperial 2030. There is also, you know, a different era, uh, Imperial. Minor differences between the two, um, but I will always choose the future because we don't look back. <laughs> That's right. Damn straight. My number 32 has dropped a couple spots. It was 19 in 2018. So I guess it wasn't even on my list last year. This is Twa, or as uh, Callan calls it, Troy's. Twa is a classic <laughs> game. In fact, I think Callan might have its successor, Twa Dice, on his list, if you listen carefully. Excuse it's me? It's coming up further on Callan's list. Twa is, <laughs> Twa is a, uh, a game uh, all about using dice, dice placement, and also combos. Um, every game of Twa is different because of the cards that come out uh, that allow you to use dice to either gain money or to fight off these negative events that come round after round. It's got a lot of interesting things to it. I mean, the comboing is, is one thing. The dice placement is another. But also the fact that when you roll your dice, they can be purchased by other players. And there's nothing you can do. You can't refuse somebody but trying to buy your nice big six die. Full of combos. Really, really interesting game. And one that I uh, really enjoy. That is... I just want everyone to know that it's late. We're all getting tired. That's why Mark doesn't sound that exciting about Twa because it is an incredible game that deserves more excitement and will be given that excitement later. I'm full of energy. I'm blazing over here. Not for Twa. All right. Well, Twa is number 32 on my list. My 31st best game of all time. I could not be more excited to talk about it enthusiastically right Pump now. Pump it up. This is 
Gaia project, uh, and this is actually in the exact same spot as it was last year, funnily enough. Again, similar to what I was saying to you about Yalo and Yangtze, you might ask where Terra Mystica is on my list. I didn't want to have both, and I prefer Gaia project. Gaia project is, in my mind, an improvement in every way on Terra Mystica. It is a game. Wrong. It is a game about building colonies on planets different types of buildings which are going to get you different types of resources using those resources allow you to get different buildings and you're eventually building up to these very cool mega powerful buildings which are going to unlock your asymmetric factions power which is unique to you in fact one of the best things about guy project is that every faction plays completely differently from another they have unique powers they have unique balances of resources unique starting conditions and all of this sort of plays out on this star map where you're jostling for control of planets so that you're trying to get to a planet before someone else does so there's this degree of interactivity which i think a lot of the detractors might argue is somewhat reduced from terra mystica but i also think that what gaia project smartly does is it varies out the map at the start of the game and kind of reduces some of the scripted openings from terra mystica it has a little bit less sense of geography but i don't think it's any less competitive and i think the addition of this tech tree that you're moving down is a brilliant addition gaia project is an excellent game in my number 31 in this case, I prefer we do look back <laughs> to Terra Mystica. You don't even like Terra Mystica. <laughs> yes, I do. All right. I am going to bring the excitement because this is my 31st favorite game of all time. And this game is something that you can break out at a convention, at a bar, at, at a party, any game night, even at a party. You could even break this out at a party and I think it would go over well. This is a game that even though it works in all of those settings, it is also packed full of excitement, bluffing, an auction is very important. Let me just say this. Let me um, just say this. Dice manipulation. I'm it was made by and, It was and, made by a doctor, but not a real doctor. I'm getting not a real doctor. Not a real doctor. Monks! Woo! <laughs> I know I know Aunt Jenny's <laughs> coming to the party. <laughs> um yeah this is a game that mark and i have bonded over because it is amazing and other people just can't recognize that i literally have played this at a brewery just like i actually actually <laughs> i was taught this game at a brewery that is how simple you the rule that? set is that i was able to understand everything we broke it out on the bar we played like four games in a row this was a two-player game it was not with kellen it was an outstanding time which part contributed to how outstanding that time was the monks definitely <laughs> the dice de the dice which we roll around that we love i truly uh, joking aside truly feel that this game this actually originally when i was just kind of not thinking about it was further on my list and the more i thought about it the more excited i got and i'm just like man this game is so good I just always have such a great experience. It's so short. It's so simple. It's so small. And yet it just has, again, like we talk about all the time, the highest high. It just has such high highs. You're, you know, pre you'd pre in the, <laughs> um, I guess I should explain a little bit, which I probably don't have to, but there are two phases in this game. The first game. You definitely have to explain because I don't think anybody's familiar with this game. Who listens I, I'm also very, okay, very well, we can just spend the next 20 minutes. Does anyone have said the name of the game yet? Yeah, okay, yeah, good. good. I, I wasn't sure you did. I, think. I, think, I thought you screamed. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm actually not convinced <laughs> you actually did say <laughs> Biblios, to be perfectly honest. No, she did. She she did. Add okay, okay. You read my lips, even though you couldn't hear through the sound of yeah, your screaming. Yeah, uh, the red lining. I'm just going to really quickly explain this game for those of you who don't know um, about Biblios. Christina, we've had um, about a billion explanations of Biblios at this point. Nah. -uh. No, -uh. take as long as you need. <laughs> no, take as long. Just bust out that rule book, actually. There are two amazing phases of this game and the first game you're getting cards for free you have to make really painful decisions of which cards you're going to keep which cards you're going to let your opponents take and which cards you're going to God. put in the in the deck that will be used for the next phase of the game it's just brilliant it's brilliant and then in that next phase when you eventually get there with all the cards that everybody put in there then you are bidding on these cards and again it just gets more and more painful as the game goes there are certain cards th that allow you to ma manipulate the dice which is what each color is worth at the end of the game my, it's just great it's my, my boy fafnir died for this <laughs> yeah true this is better than fafnir <laughs> oh my god can we please just end the podcast right now 
Honestly. No, we got <laughs> we got more. That is my 31st best board game of all time, Biblios. Oh my god. <laughs> Honestly, I like it's, I, it's I like, can't I can't muster anything for my 31st now. I'm I'm you've like <laughs> vicariously I've like used it all up just listening to that. It's just yeah. I just it's like this shared delusion. There's you know, zero like, delusion. It's like, and it becomes circular, and then it just like it exists. And she's hyping it up because she knows I don't like it when you do this. I'm hyping it up <laughs> because I know what a great game it is. That's right. All right, That's this right. is my this is my turn <laughs> to be talking about my 31st favorite game, and not your turn to be talking about yours. Go ahead. Uh, my 31st game has already been mentioned in this episode, uh, coming in at Christina's number 40, my 31 by, we will appoint him a doctor, Dr. Friedman Frisa. This is Fuji Flush. For me, there is something revelatory about a simple card game that you can trick players into playing uh, that evolves into something more. You know, this feels like it's Uno, and then all of a sudden everyone's screaming at each other in a delightful way, in a way that transcends the gaming session, transcends the rules of this game. It's exceedingly silly. It's one of those shocking pieces of design that you don't think will work, and then you get into the game and you just go, wow, there's actually something here. This is really, really cool. So glad to have Fuji Flush, a fantastic game. It sounds like you're like so glad to have you on the podcast. Like you're talking to a guest stranger that you've never even met before. Get a little excited about Fuji Flush. We love this game. Two, chew, two, chew, four, chew, four, chew. I, I think that what I want to convey with all seriousness, because you people are <laughs> losing us here, we losing have us childish listeners. Wonder. Yes, that's right. It is that it's hard to make something that's simple and good, and so I, I actually think it's a la Biblios, right? Boom. I think it's more <laughs> impressive than these complicated Euro dudes on a map games that have 18 subsystems that all interact. Like, of course, it's interesting. Just reading the rule book takes an hour. But it's Fuji Flush. It's the games like Fuji Flush that somehow transcend the mass market um, and work on both levels that really uh, some of my favorite memories of board gaming in the last five years were playing Fuji Flush, which is absurd on the face of it. Really just a good game. Yeah, no, that is very insightful. That's exactly what I was looking for. Thank you, Colin. All right, my turn. She's the host. On to Mark's 31st all right. best board game of all time. Christina's 31st best board game of all time was Biblios. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. on to well, Neelan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, my 31st actually has been dropping. Honestly, like I said, I, I don't even have the gas for it anymore after using all my energy on applauding Christina's number 31 but my number 31 was 12 in 2018 9 last year and has dropped all the way to 31 this is Voyages of Marco Polo I still think it's a great game it's just been hurt by a couple things for me one is playing it online the online Im- implementation is, is fine but there's some player powers that are not available there's only four player powers available in the online impl- implementation and I think that sort of hurt my plays of it also, Voyages of Marco Polo 2, which I think is an inferior game and wasn't anywhere near my top 50, is still a fine game, but it's sort of, whatever reason, waters it down in my mind a little bit. I think it's a great game. It's really well, well designed. The player powers are amazing, but for whatever reason, just slipped down my list. may come back up, but for right now, it's 31, The Voyages of Marco Polo. Another COVID casualty. Interestingly, Mark, right. it, I was very sure that this was going to be the year that Voyages of Marco Polo was going to appear on my list, but I think I had the exact same reaction, where I think that, that us playing it online somewhat just diminished some of my enthusiasm for it. And uh, that's yeah. a hard barrier to get past, because it's not exactly fair, but like I just couldn't muster the energy to be like, I cared enough about this to see it on my list. Sure. I think that's a really interesting insight, Mark, that the idea that the existence of the sequel waters down the like sort of classic perfection of the original in this weird way that's hard to articulate where the game itself is supposed to exist on like a chess like or a go like plane you know and like these games like Hans Teutonica and Voyages of Marco Polo have sort of this classic status and then when you go actually we improved upon it and here's two you're kind of like what and also, it makes you look back at one with different eyes. Yeah, abs- you're absolutely correct, 100%, but it can go the other way, and that'll be further up my list. A little preview. That's a sneak peek, a little tease. That's it. Oh, and that's it. 
It's over. Wait, can Christina do her 31st again? <laughs> <laughs> all right. My 31st. I'm just do kidding. It. Okay. Yeah. So thank you all for listening. Thank you for being supporters of the podcast and for, you know, sticking with us through another year of games number 40 through 31. My first year, but their third year. Thank you to Heart Society Music for our intro and outro song, What's On Your Mind, Kid? If you want to come chat with us and talk about these games or not, talk about whatever, anything else, you can do that at boardgamebrowse.com slash discord. And that is the end of our top 50, number 40 through 31. Happy holidays. I don't know when this is being released, but... <laughs> Hopefully it's still the holidays it's wherever you thing. are. Hopefully it's the <laughs> holidays. Thanks for listening and goodbye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Red. My 36th game is Splendor. This is impenetrable. Yeah. I know. Oh, sorry. You should cut me out saying that. You should say it's impenetrable. <laughs> no, thank you. What? Um, <laughs> she said that like she was going to jump at it. Like, can I please? Yeah. <laughs> what? No, I was, that was a friendly suggestion. <laughs>